Today, I want to talk about how to live as a citizen of heaven. And uh, we're talking about the Beatitudes. But how do you live as a citizen of heaven? Matthew 5, 1 sets a setting, and Jesus is teaching by the beautiful sea of Galilee on sloping hills, and it's a gorgeous looking place, sloping hills, and you look out of the sea, I've been there twice, and you just want to spend all day there. I mean, you could just camp there, and, you know, I can see why Jesus made Capernaum in that area his kind of headquarters, because it is absolutely drop-dead gorgeous. It's like a park, and uh, so he's teaching by this beautiful place, and, and it's called the Sermon on the Mount, because it was, it was you know, a place of, of uh, hillsides and and a beautiful greenery all around, and uh, it was just a beautiful, beautiful place. And Matthew is is setting this as an intimate teaching setup where he sits down. The rabbi sits with his students, but a crowd kind of gathers around. I talked about that last week. But here is the essence of Jesus' teaching, and we're going to see a little bit later that he also took this message and he and he preached it in different places because it was really who Jesus was that he was trying to get across. Barclay commentated, he says that this is what he used to teach them as as a foundation of faith. And it's more important this morning, I want you to recognize that that we're not going to only talk about God saving grace, which is salvation, but also his transforming grace that takes place. His transforming grace. Because when we get saved, we become a new creation, don't we? When we get saved, something changes and we're not the same anymore, we're different. And I believe when Jesus comes into our life and into our heart, there's a transforming that takes place in you as an individual. And so here Jesus is probing the the inner being, the inner being, our inner, it's a question of our our motive of why we live. It's also been said that the larger question is, is not what a person does, but why he does what he does. You know, why do you do what you do? It's not just what you do, but why do you do it? And so he starts off with verse 1, teaching his disciples. And he talks about a blessedness or a happiness, a, a supreme blessedness that comes out of the word shalom, which, which, really means, which really means a peace, shalom. But it's an expression of peace that, that in John 14, 27, Jesus says, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, I give unto you. The poor in spirit are those who are absolute poverty of the spirit and who are solely dependent upon God. As a person that has no confidence in their own flesh, no confidence really in their own success or their own achievements, but they enjoy the gift of God, his acceptance, his grace, his fellowship, and that's the motive of why they do things. It's out of relationship with Jesus that becomes the motive of of who they are and what they do, and and it should be of ours. We do what we do not because of who we are, but because of who he is in us. And that's why Jesus can say, my peace I give unto you. That's why we can have peace in times when even a family member passes away. We can have peace in times that we lose our job. Because the world doesn't understand. We can have peace in time that we may have lost everything and a flood comes in, but there's something different about us. There's a peace that comes not out of the conditions that surround us, but out of a relationship we have in Jesus. So Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, I want to talk today about what it does not mean because there's a lot of misconceptions of what it means to be poor in spirit. Some of the misconceptions that we have today that we live that if you want to be great and successful, you have to be controlling. You have to be self-assertive. If you want to be 
successful, you've got to be your own boss, your own person, your own self. You've got to work hard, diligently to achieve and climb up the ladder. You've got to strain to get ahead at all costs. The world says you've got to put yourself on the throne and stomp on other people as you walk up that ladder of success. And you don't need to be dependent. You don't need anybody or anything to get there because you're self-achieving. You're self-reliance. You don't need anybody. Now, these things may be true and good, but they're not eternal. They will get you temporal things. But the Bible says, it says to work hard. It says to have good ethics. It says that you will receive word, rewards as you work diligently. It just is, is part of when you work hard, you're going to achieve for what you work for. And, but there's plenty, and there's plenty of warnings about against being slothfulness or laziness. So we are to have a good work ethic. Another way that poor in spirit does not mean, it does not mean that you have to be financially poor to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not talking about finances here, and, and that's a lot of times uh, people get a misconception. Understand this. Catch this. There's no poverty in heaven. <laughs> There's no poverty in heaven. God wants us to be able to bless others with whatever we have, whatever we've prospered, what, whatever we have, God wants us to use with purpose to be able to bless others. We bring redemption to society, and as we have a team coming back for the Dominican Republic, there are villages that, that we've been in for the 10 or 15 years that we've been going there that have totally changed because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're prospering now. They used to be in shacks that just looked like that, and now they've got brick homes, and they're, they're prospering in that place, in those villages. So they're finding other, other villages to pour into because as Christ enters in, there's a change, and you're going to see that. There's a change. In, that lady didn't want to live that, leave that place when she got a demon cast out of her because God met her there, and she prospered. Huh. When Jesus comes into our life, there's a change. When, when Jesus comes into that society, there's a film that, that was, was, was several years ago about transformation. Whole cities were transformed by God. And they didn't stay the same. They prospered. They had carrots that were growing as big as your arm, and I didn't believe it until I saw that film. They, they had cabbage that was huge, and these third world countries were now prospering. In fact, the, the jails closed down and the bars closed down because there was, they were all going to church. And they're driving these Mercedes-Benz. They had all these old trucks before. Now they're driving Mercedes-Benz trucks that were like phenomenal trucks because they were prospering because God was there. So sometimes we get this uh, a mentality that, of poorness, that in a Christian we have to be poor and we've got to have glasses and have our, our, our things rolled up and a booger in our finger and, you know, be nerdy, you know. It's like that's not Christianity. If God is in our life, there should be a prosperity that takes place in us when we're living for God. Why? Because he wants us to be change makers. And you might say, well, I not have much. Well, the much that you have, use it to prosper others. Use it to bless others. What God trusts you in little, he'll give you much. You see, he doesn't test you with the million dollars. He tests you with $10. What do you do with it? <laughs> We are agents of redemption when we have the presence of God. We, we redeem not just in part, but we redeem in whole. We, we re redeem emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and physically. And we've seen financially whole societies being transformed when they have a renewal that takes place in that city. I believe if Elmira would have a transformation, a redemption that would take place in our city, we would not be poverty stricken. It would change our whole thing. That's really what I believe. We need to have redemption take place in our marketplace, in our government, in our educational institutions, in our homes, in the medical field, 
If we start seeing the Christians and having an impact upon our society and they bring God into it, I believe we see transformation because it's what God does. It's bringing the kingdom here on earth. We need redemption to take place. It's got to first start in us, and we've got to be recreated in him. And I believe that God places us in positions of influence because he wants us to have influence upon our society. So many times the, the church was like this, is that, you, you know the old story about the trains coming down and there was uh, a road runner on the road and he was with a guy and he dug a hole and buried his head. He said, why do you do that? Because if I bury my head, I won't see it. You know, the train came and wiped it out. It didn't matter if he buried his head, if he saw it or not, the train was still coming, wasn't it? The church a lot of times has buried its head and we haven't involved in society. We haven't gotten involved in education. We haven't gotten involved in government things and all the things. And we buried our heads into the church and uh, we've been closed. Instead of saying, let's train our people, let's bring up our people to be in society, to be in these areas, to have influence. <clears throat> In Korea, in 1960, or after the war, it was one of the poorest nations. The average person made $60 per year. Now Korea is one of the 10 largest economic nations. They said that this was contributed to a revival that broke out. It changed the attitude of the people. In a place that there was no hope, it gave hope. There gave a, a change of perspective to apathy to one of, there's a purpose for reason, uh, for living. There's something that they would, they'd have to give and contribute. There was an importance that gave to how they lived and, and who they were. And God made that change. And yes, we have to be aware that success can bring issues. What happens when we start seeing financially an increase in our lives? The danger or the warning of prosperity or with success is that Christians can fall to materialism. Christians can fall to pride, to arrogance. And all of a sudden, we've lost our first love. We lose that childlike dependency upon God. We, we lose our humility. And we move into more of a love of man, which really becomes a form of idolatry in our lives. And and Christians fall into that many, many times. We need the grace of God. He wants us to bless us so we can become a blessing. We're, we're not to conform to this world or sucked into the world's philosophy or the way of thinking, the humanism, the greed. In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it, it says that we're to be not conformed to the world, but what? Be transformed. And then we become a transforming agent. We, don't, we can be in a secular situation. We can transform that situation. That's agents of change, isn't it? And we're all called to be agents of change. Another misunderstanding is, is about living in poverty. The idealism came and played in the third century. It came through Gnosticism, which was a heresy teaching. The Greek philosophy said that the material world is evil and only things of the spirit is good. So the church launched and adapted this mentality that anything of the world is evil. And even leads to clergy making vows of poverty and vows of chastity. And, and only when they were doing this is that there was a measure of obedience that they had that was more than anyone else. Now, obedience is good but it became a, a religious order, it became a religious spirit. And I don't have a problem if someone feels that their God has called them to not get married or to have a gift of celibacy and commit to that, to be separated, to serve God in that way, it's not a bad thing. But then to place it or to say you can't serve God and unless you, you do that becomes a religious spirit. And so to be a good pastor, a lot of mentality is 
well, they've got to be poor. They can't have any money. If they're successful or if they come through, then, then they're, they've abused the church. They've robbed from the poor. And that's just not good teaching. In the 4th century, the emperor of Rome put an uh, order to confiscate all the property of Christians so they may be poor to make sure that they're able to enter into heaven. So if you want to be poor, then uh, you can give all your properties to me. I'll take them. And I'm sure that God will, will bless your works. It's just a wrong philosophy that we've had and, and some even have today. You know, you don't have to be poor to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, in, what happens is that in Luke 6.20, it's called the Sermon on the Plain. It's, it's where Jesus has taken some of the same teaching. And it says in, in Luke 6, it says, He went down with them and stood at a level place. That's called, called the Sermon on the Plain. And a large crowd of his disciples were there and a great number of people from all over Judea, all over Jerusalem and the, the coast had come to hear him. And, he, and it says that he healed their diseases and, and they were troubled by evil spirits and they were cured and people tried to touch him and the power that Jesus had just coming from him, he was healing them all. And, and looking at his disciples, he said, blessed are you who are poor. And so he takes a twist to this because it says in the commentary that that pretty much the audience was different from the one that was on the Sermon on the Mount, that these were more of a people that are coming from a poor background that were poor. And he said, blessed who are poor. But Jesus is really talking on the Sermon on the Mount that we look today. He says, blessed who are poor in what? In the spirit. And so it's a little bit different emphasis that Jesus is doing. The emphasis, I believe, is placed as a core message is that God wants us to be humble and poor in spirit. Jesus came to break through society. He came to break through what was the norm of society. He broke through and gave us our eternal destiny here and now. He broke through and brought a healing physically, emotionally, and spiritual. He brought prosperity to us in the fullness. There's an attitude that Jesus is teaching from, and he's, he's asking his disciples as he's looking out and seeing many of the poor, and it's a, it's, it's a posturing of our spirit before God and deep humility and deep dependence upon God and also a deep dependence on one another. It's a hard attitude. It's a, it's a brokenness before God and before others. Psalms 51, 17, King David at a time that when he uh, sinned, he sinned much and he was forgiven much. And in that forgiveness, there was a brokenness that took place in a king's heart. And he says, my sacrifice, O God, is, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. That this God will not despise. And that's what he asks us to have. That, that's being poor in spirit. And here is a king, a rich king, one of the richest men that's been, and his son even took on greater riches. It wasn't an issue of what he had physically. It was a matter of the heart. It's a matter of posturing of our spirit john 15 5 jesus says i'm the vine and you are the branches apart from him uh, you and i can do nothing he who abides or obeys in me shall bear much fruit so as we realize that our connection is that we are just branches and he is the vine that being part of the Spirit is to recognize our need for God. And it's also a need for one another. For the body of Christ, there's, you realize that there's over 50 one another scriptures referring to one another. We're not to be solo Christians. We're to love one another, serve one another, give to one another. Examples, for over 50 examples the Bible says to one another in the Bibles. 
God wants us to recognize that we need each other also. We just don't need just God. We're seeing an incredible response to the gospel to the poor nations because they're ripe for redemption. It's where revivals are breaking out today out in the developing nations. There's cities of transformation that are happening because there becomes a deep hunger in India, Latin America, Africa, Nigeria. They're saying that there's over 35,000 being saved every day in India today, one of the poorest nations. The majority of the world today is poor, but there's an openness that's taking place. Not in America where there's self-sufficiency. There's pride. We can do it on our own, and who needs God? In a book that Philip Yancey wrote, uh, it's called Jesus I Never Knew, he, he talks about what's, an upside-down kingdom, and he talks about lessons learned from poor people. And uh, here are just five things I want to bring out. Well, no, six. And here's lessons from poor people. It says, not only uh, know their dependence on God, also on people and their independence and their interdependence on one another. The second thing is that the poor rest their security not on things, but on people. The poor don't have uh, no dependence of their own importance, like pride, and they don't uh, feel like they deserve anything. The poor expect little from competition, but much from cooperation. The poor can distinguish from necessities and luxuries from needs, and from wants. When you can't afford luxuries, you need to be content on your needs that are not being met. The Apostle Paul said that, I learned to be content in every situation, whether I have much or plenty or I have little. And then the last is number six. It says the poor responds to the gospel with a certain abandonment or uncomplicated loyalty because they have little to lose they're ready for anything today i believe that god can make a shift he had, since 9/11 he's made a shift in our country what we thought was security in america we don't have that security anymore and i believe there could be a transfer of of wealth The rich will see a need for kingdom principles. The power and prestige that uh, once was their strength, now they see that they need the grace of God and a desire to do mighty works for the kingdom of God. We need to pray for the rich as much as we pray for the poor. The church has worked with the poor, and they will continue to help the poor, but we have fallen short of really looking at the successful or the influential, thinking that they don't need God. Some people think it's not spiritual or it's, or it's too hard to try to reach out to those who are successful. And you want to know something? The reality is it's very difficult to reach someone who, who is successful, reach out to those who have. The have-nots are always easier to reach. And sometimes a church has pulled away and sat back and have done nothing to try to even touch or reach those. We end up sitting back upon our morals and the easy work instead of looking at our community and say, how can we really transform a community? I believe there's a responsibility that all of us have, and there needs to be an action and an involvement on our part. How can God place you in a place that you can have influence? I believe God will say to you that, I will do the supernatural, and I will give increase if you'll only make yourself available. I believe he can make a, a shift and, and recover what was lost. He can take the redeemed, which is us, and transform our community. 
Are you willing to be a change maker? I want to challenge you with that. Being poor in spirit, you're able to come into a place that you get so full of God, and God comes in and does such a work in you that you can't help marching out and taking the orders from God and, and being that light to, to wherever he's placed you, in your school, in your workplace, in your home. Well, how, how to work out this, this poor in spirit? I'm going to end by giving us six different things to think about. Six things that, that I recommend. First is to choose humility. Never does it say that you can receive the gift of humility. There is no impartation of humility. You can't get humility preyed on. Philippians 2, Jesus said to be humble and humbled himself even to the point of obedience. Oh, let's just read that scripture together in Philippians 2. It says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort in his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy by complete by being like-minded. Having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in what? Humility. Consider others better than yourself. That's being poor in the spirit, isn't it? Each of you should look not at your own interests, but also at the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus, who being in the same nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in a human likeness, and being found in the appearance as man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, and that name is Jesus. Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of his Father and the glory to our Father. Choose humility. Walk humbly before God and before others. If not, pride becomes before the fall, doesn't it? Think others more important than yourself. The second area to look at is have a teachable and accountable submissive spirit. If you humble yourself, you'll have these characters. You'll become teachable. You become accountable. You become submissive. When someone comes to talk to you, you don't have a, your pride wells up and you don't listen. It's being able to listen to what someone says as they talk to you. First look at yourself and see what changes need to be made before you go to somebody else. Humble yourself. Find someone that could be an accountability a partner to you. And then say this, I give you permission to speak into my life. Man, that, the, see, that's very hard. I give you permission to speak into my life. And then when they start sharing something with you, you've got to humble yourself and listen to that. Because if not, you just shut it out, don't you? We all do it. Choose to be in a covenant relationship. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, read that when you have a chance. We need each other. We need restoring covenant relationships. We live in a society that we don't know what covenant means. We don't really know what commitment means to one another. We don't have co covenant relationships in our marriage or with family. We don't have covenant relationships in the church. Everyone becomes a lone ranger, and there's no sense of commitment today. It's in society I mean, they can hardly even put together a football team because guys don't want to commit to coming out to practice every day of the week. And then what about committing to something in church? Oh, oh no, no, I'm too busy. Don't want to do that. We've lost a sense of committing. 
God is a covenant God, and he asks us to be in covenant relationship with things in our life. Number four is consistently be in the presence of God. That means reading his word, soaking in his presence. Continue what takes place on a Sunday to build that into you through the week, a worship time, a receiving time, a trusting him, dependence on him. Get to the place I can do nothing without him because I'm poor in spirit. Fifth is to walk in faith. Dependency takes faith. You're trusting in him in faith. And it's a believing faith that I preached about uh, last week. Believing in the promises of scripture. Believing prophetic words as you, as you test them out that's been spoken over your life. And as God talks you in the word and the, the word comes alive to you and the prophetic word is speaking to your heart, listen to it. Listen to your heart as you're reading scripture. Listen to what God is saying to you through his Holy Spirit. He's speaking to you, and a lot of times you're just not listening. You know, you got you to turn off the lights of the world and get to a dark place where it's quiet to really hear the voice of God speaking to your heart. And then the last thing is that uh, we are what we are by the grace of God the grace of God, realizing that I'm nothing except for the grace of God. And all, if I want to boast of things we have, it's because God just allowed it to happen in our lives. You know, and I can boast of great things because God has done great things, and I've seen great things. And I'm happy and excited about what God is doing. Be change makers in our society. Take a Take a role of being humble before God, but take a role that God wants to use you to make a change and bring his kingdom into our society. Would you stand with me? And I want to pray prosperity over you, and I want to pray prosperity over our valley. Hi, I'm Pastor John McConnell, and I'd like to welcome you today for watching our program. It's just amazing the technology we have today that we're able to live stream all around the world. And we'd like to give you an opportunity, if you'd like to give towards this ministry, you can go online and be able to uh, follow the directions that are on there and be able to give to the ministry that you've been watching. So God bless you. We thank you for being part of Southside Alliance Church today.